C. Selfane. The music for this Easter hymn was composed by Frederick C. Maker in 1881. John 19.25 is the scriptural reference for this hymn. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us so that we could be free and enjoy life forever. I thank you, God, too, for the many blessings you give us for homes that have air conditioning and heat, for cars that run well and that give us air conditioning and heat, and also, too, Lord, for the people around us that you give us in our lives, Lord, that we love, that we share life with and enjoy. God, we thank you for your love for us. We could never pay it back, but we thank you for your shed blood on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just give you praise and thanksgiving for the wonderful blessings you've given to us in this life. God, I want to thank you for America. What a great place it is to live. For all the blessings that you've given to us in the past and how, Lord, we have been able to live free and enjoy this wonderful experience of America. We're so proud, Lord, but we pray for our leaders. Pray that you'll give them wisdom and they can understand what the leaders of the past who sit, built this country and, and laid the foundation for it, that they will look to you for their wisdom and not their own selfish greed or their own desires. I pray, Father God, too, that, Lord, you'll be with us in the many crises that are all over our nation and the struggles that we're having. I want to pray, too, Lord, for those who protect us. We think of those who are on foreign soils who are away from family and friends, but that, Lord, are protecting the freedoms that we have. And I praise you, too, for the brothers and sisters who are out on the streets every day in our community, keeping us safe, for police, for fire, for EMS, who deal with many of the crises that go on in our city that we never even hear of. I pray for them, Lord, keep them safe, protect them. 
We praise you too, Lord, for one who said that they're so grateful for you, Jesus, for dying for them on the cross. We praise you especially, Father God, too, for a friend that, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Bowles, who's uh, got cancer right now, that I just pray, Dr. Bott, that you be with him in his battle. We pray for healing. We pray also, too, for Kendra Reynolds, who's starting a new job in law enforcement up in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Lord, just watch over her, Christ. Give her strength. I want to pray especially, too, for Todd Ogile and this heart situation that he has right now. We pray for healing for him. We pray for his wife, Angie, who also is battling cancer. Lord, I want you to please put your hand of healing on them and take away that cancer. I pray also, too, for that, for Samantha Mama, Blake's daughter, who, Lord, is battling cancer on her brain. For Mark Dopps, Father God. For Leanne's death, Lord, we thank you for her, who, who's many years been on this earth, and for the family that the Baskervilles, and for our brother Steve here this morning, was his sister-in-law, that you'll be with them and bring comfort to joy that we know that she's with you, Christ, today, and that she has to battle no more of the inadequacies of her life and the deformities of her life than now she's fully whole and free. I pray also, too, for Heather, Father God. You know what she needs. I pray that she'll open her eyes, Lord, and see what she really has, Father God, that she'll see the beauty of the family there. I pray also, too, Father God, for Phil, who had um, bypass surgery this way, continue to heal him. We also pray for Betty, who had cancer removed from her skin. I pray also, too, Father God, for... Paul, as he's dealing with some health issues himself. I think Heavenly Father, too, of uh, Doug, who's dealing with some issues. We pray for Judy, who's had bone spurs removed from her foot, bring healing to her. And Father God, now we also come to you with others on our mind. We think especially of those who are in, locked into addiction. I think of a young man like Ryan and Jordan and David and Eric and Ricky and Mitch, all these guys that are battling their addiction, Father, that they will hand it over and let it go down and come to you, Christ, and give themselves for you fully and wholly. And Father, we pray, Father God, for our church as we're moving into a new direction, Lord, I just pray that you'll bless it. And that, Lord, we can make a big impact upon our community here. And we pray also for the school, for the many children that are taught about you, Christ, every day, but also, too, are taught about the way to deal with the world and be strong in you, Christ. And now, Father God, I pray that you'll open our ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to each one of us individually. We thank you, Lord, for him to come by our side and Teach us from your word, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Throughout Western civilization, we are so blessed to be have the Ten Commandments as one of the foundations of our nation. The civilized world has this opportunity in which we have in that we are based on many of the things in our Constitution. 35 quotes from the Constitution of the United States and many of the principles that come out of the Old Testament. Our society has been blessed from coming not to be chaotic, not to be mayhem, but that the meta-narrative in America has always been the Judeo-Christian ethic and morals. But as we know, that is being diminished by our society today. That's why Christian schools are growing. God has given us the Ten Commandments, gave it to Moses, many years ago. And it was for the people of Israel, but now it's been a blessing to America for 250 years. And some of the metaphors that it does, it's a map to us. It's a muzzle to keep down what society sometimes will let go of. It becomes a mirror to show us where we fail and lead us to Jesus Christ, but also for a society. It's the master that calls us 
that easily fall short of his will. And it's a mentor to teach us. The Jewish leaders in the Old Testament had 618 laws to deal with. And today, have we just finished last week the Ten Commandments. Now in chapters 21 through 23, Moses is being taught by God case law. What happens when certain things happen? What do you do? How do you deal with them? Now Jesus broke it up into two tablets, we know. He took the Ten Commandments and he said, the first four deal with your relationship with God. In summarizing it, he said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love the neighbor as yourself. And those two commandments hang all the laws of the prophets. And Jesus was right. Tim Keller wrote in short that the coming of Christ changed our worship from ceremonial to being personal and individual. That we also realize that the character of God in the Old Testament is taught through the Old Testament of his integrity, of his love, of his faithfulness. And that we learn from the Old Testament loving our neighbor is generosity and taking care of the poor and giving away our possessions and social relationships and commitment to the family. These are the bases, and Jesus reinforced them. In fact, people think that now Jesus, we don't need to know. That's not true. The Bible talks to us in Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus reinforces all the commands that were given here by Moses, even more difficult. When he said, thou shalt not commit adultery, Jesus said, if you look upon a woman lustfully, it's like committing adultery. Jesus reinforced it. He said, if you talk about somebody and you say to them, raka, you call them empty skull, it's like murdering them. That's how strict Jesus brought this to us. And that we are to be faithful to his word and to follow him. No matter how hard we try, though, to keep it, sometimes we fail. And that's what the law does. It points us to our need because we fail. I do. I commit sin. And that I need a Savior, Jesus Christ, to save me. And sometimes we don't even realize how wicked our hearts can be. I was laughing the other day when I heard about a man who had a refrigerator. He bought a new one over at Home Depot and he put the old one out in front of his house and put a sign on it, free, looking for a home. It was a good refrigerator, but his wife wanted one of those big jobs. He bought it and put the one out in the street, and nobody took it. So the next day, he put on it $50, and it was gone by the next day. Somebody had stolen it. That's the way we are today, is it not? How easy it can happen. But today, we look at the law of the Lord. And the law of the Lord is so precious to us. It helps us. And it's hard for people sometimes to think that the Old Testament has anything to do with nothing. But it does. It's very valuable. In fact, it's 75% of the Bible. We need to obey it and hear it because it's from the inspiration of God. And what we find here, David in the psalm talks to us about it. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. I've had people say, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to learn about God. I'm a Christian and I know him and that's it. But what a powerful thing when we learn that those scriptures call us to meet together and to learn more about God and to learn more about his ways. How powerful it is when we come to realize that. And that we understand that we fall short. Some people don't like coming to church and I know because we feel guilty sometimes. But what a beautiful thing it is to learn that what Christ has saved us from and we can do better and we have power of the Holy Spirit to overcome and do those things. Ignorance is not bliss. Do you know why? Well, Jesus told us why. He says to us, in order to get to heaven, if you're going to try to do it on your own works and follow the law and be good enough, he says, be perfect as I am the Father am perfect and nobody that I know of, I know I'm not, perfect. And so David here in the psalm says, this is what the psalm, he says, this is what the law is about. 
First, he says the law gives us the perfect understanding of what God desires, and that is hard to fulfill. None of us can. And that's because, and then when we look at that and we see ourselves, it's a testimony. It converts our soul. We realize we need Jesus Christ. We need God's forgiveness. We need God's help in order to try to fulfill and follow God's law out of thankfulness to him. And then his testimony is sure. He says here that this is the right way to do it. This is God's way. There's a lot of people out in the world who don't think that. But the Bible says here and the word says to us that God's way is the sure way, the only way. And that it makes us wise. Even the simple. I had a high school reunion. It was our 50th high school reunion. And I got to be with one of my buddies who I played football with. You know, Bill is one of these guys who's the life of the party. Great guy. Very effervescent, very bubbly. In fact, he was leading the crowd and many of the dances and doing all the kinds of things. And everybody just loves Bill. But when Bill and I sat down at the table and we talked, little did anybody know that was Bill Broken. And Bill said to me, Dave, I should have listened to you when we were back in high school. I should have followed what you said to me about getting right with the Lord. And then he began to tell me his story. Went off to the University of Connecticut. Wound up having to come home at the end of his middle of the year because his skin turned, turned yellow. And wound up, here he was, he was drinking himself to death. Realized that at that point he was an alcoholic and he needed to stop. He got in business because his father had a business and he was working with his brother and father. And when dad died, things were going good for a while and his brother got into all these business adventures. But then things went south. Now they can't even talk. They don't even talk to each other. They talk through lawyers because they're trying to divide things up. And they both hate each other. And then he shared with me also that he had been married three times and the woman that he's living with now was not his wife. And his only one daughter does not speak with him. She hates him. And here is Bill, the life of the party, is broken. And I said to Bill, Bill, well, why don't you put your life together now with Christ? Open yourself up to the Lord. And he said, well, Dave, I really like to, but... I still like this life. Are you kidding me? But that's where he's at. I said, you sure? Because he'll do that. And I said, if ever you want, I gave him my card and said, call me. And you hit another bottom spot, call me and maybe we can talk to you through that. The Bible tells us today in 1 Corinthians 10 that the things that happened in the Old Testament to them as were an example to us. They were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. The Old Testament is there for us to see what we need to do and how to live life and how to live this faith for Christ. And then it says in Romans, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. When we go through those difficult times, the scriptures are there to support us and to give us hope. And when we don't see it, and the practical applications are there for us so that we can hold on to the Lord and he can carry us even when we can't even move. We look at some of the practical applications today of the Ten Commandments. One of the beautiful things it talks to us about about how not only it converts our souls and helps us to see Jesus, but also it helps the society. And its application is tremendous. 200 years ago, a man by the name of Edwin, Edward Gibbon wrote a six-volume series on the decline of the Roman Empire. He spent 20 years studying the Roman Empire and then put down his observations. And it's chilling to hear what he said about the Roman Empire. 
Now, you're talking about he let this, and, and it's interesting how he had published this book, these volumes, in 1776. And listen to what he said. Number one is the rapid increase in divorce has undermined the sanctity of the home and the basis of society. Number two, higher and higher taxes that were spent for public money for bread and circuses. <laughs> Number three, the mad craze for pleasure with sports becoming year every year more exciting and more brutal. The building of gigantic armies to fight the external enemies when most deadly enemy was inside the nation itself. And the decry and the decay of religion, fading faith into just a mere form rather than a relationship with God. To me, it was sobering. It sounded like he just wrote it last week at an op-ed page at the New York Times. And that's why the Bible tells us that the word of God is God-breathed. It's useful for everything in our own personal life, but also for our society. And it gives us the foundation for which we can live. And what it does, it reveals to us much about this eternal God. The attributes of God are spelled out in the Old Testament beautifully. It talks about being chosen. We are a chosen people in Jesus Christ, but so are the chosen people of Israel. And they were a priesthood of believer. They were a special group of people just like us. The Old Testament lays the foundation for teaching in the New Testament. In fact, there's only 12 chapters in the New Testament that do not have a quote from the Old Testament. And the entire Old Testament points to Christ. When Jesus was on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection, he was with two disciples. And as they're walking along, the Bible says to us, Jesus, starting with Moses... And then the prophets interpret them the scriptures about what had happened to him in his resurrection. That's why it's so important. This thing that was said by Augustine, he said a beautiful thing that summarized it all. He said the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. That means you can't see it, but it's there. You have to really look. But the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And all that the prophets and all that was spoken about Jesus now comes to fruition in the New Testament. And so that's why we come to the Old Testament. We look at the laws and how important they are. How the scriptures are there. And yes, there are things that don't apply to our society. But there's principles behind them. We have to ask ourselves, what are those laws today? One of the things you're, we're going to ask is ourselves, what about slavery? It talks about it in the Bible. And it also talks about capital punishment. That's a very controversial society problem. And it also talks about stealing. There's some people who want to go to socialism in our country. And don't feel capitalism should be. They're pushing for that in our society. And one of the rules that we have, we take from the Westminster Confession, and it's called... The general equity. And that means that we see what the scriptures are saying and we take out of it the principle that is helpful for us in our society today and apply it. You see, the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament, and you see there's three ways in which God gave law in the Old Testament. Number one was civil law, how we're to treat one another. The second was moral law and how we're to live with our own personal lives morally. And the third was ceremonial law, which was how to worship God. And early on, God taught that because he was teaching them how to law. But the ceremonial was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. So no longer do we have to figure about, I can't eat this or I can't that. The Jewish laws had those eating laws. Those don't apply. Because in the book of Hebrews, it says that he's fulfilled all that. And we don't have to do that anymore. But the civil law and the moral law. We have some tremendous applications for our society. And I tell you, there are Christians on both sides that argue about it and fight about it. In fact, and it's even used. You see, some of you remember that old the TV show several years ago called West Wing? 
And who was the president but Mr. Martin Sheen? How he mocked the Old Testament law, made fun of it by bringing out the laws that were there that were obscure and only fit for their society and made everybody laugh and say, and then he just transferred it right over to homosexuality and said that was wrong too. You see, the Bible stands in its morality. And it stands for what is right. God's the one who sets the agenda, not Martin Sheen, not the playwrights, not the writers of the scripts for Hollywood, but God does. Because we're a set-apart people, God has these laws for us. They're guides. As far as the civil laws were concerned, it was about waging war what we can get involved with, what we can't. And that Canaanite culture was inherited morally wicked, brutal in its way. And God even said about the Canaanites, he said, that land makes me want to vomit. And they were given 400 years to get it cleaned up and they never did. And God brought in the Israelites, a new home. And they, they caused... Jericho to collapse and took over the Canaan land and then established these laws. The ceremonial laws of case were fulfilled by Christ. But then the moral laws, ordinances, commands that we need to still keep today that keep us in the sanity of Christ and godliness. And what we find here is a beautiful thing. Now, one thing happens in our society. There are some people who say, we don't need to listen to that anymore. That's totally wrong. And there's others who say, well, let's bring it all on and let's bring it all back to the Old Testament, which is known of a group called the Theomust. That's not what God wants. Instead, God gives us a basic understanding of the law. That's why these case laws are coming to us today. To help us to see, and that's why general equity means taking the principles out of what God says in the Old Testament, out of that culture, and using that to apply to make our society better. And we can do that. It's called civil law, or it's called moral law. And it's affect our society that makes it great. See, that's what makes our nation so great with our early fathers of this nation. They believed the word and they built the law on that. Those abiding principles. And so today, we come up with three laws. We're going to talk about first slavery. And this is the Lord of life gives us this. Now these are the rules that you sell set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh, he shall go out free for nothing. Now, if you know anything about slavery in that time, when nations won wars, they took slaves. Israel was not allowed to do that. The only thing that they could do, there's two scenarios, and that a servant or a slave becomes one by giving themselves over to a person because they're in financial debt. And they are sold and they sell themselves into slavery so that they can't afford the debt that they have and so they sell themselves. And sometimes what happened with the end of, and, and God has it, that in the six years they serve and on the seventh year, just like in Genesis, where we have the first five, six days of creation, and on the seventh we rest. So God made the laws that six years they served, but on the seventh they could be set free. And that they were able to leave. And there are sometimes what would happen is that some would become slaves permanently and have their ears clipped with an earring because their slavery with that person and serving that person and their family was so enjoyable and they felt that they couldn't make it on their own out in society, so they stayed and gave themselves to servitude for that family for the rest of their lives. And there were some who did that. Others were set free. 
And if they accumulated another debt, they'd have to go back and do that with another person that they accumulated debt. And here the Bible shows us then <clears throat> how they're to do it. It's just not common sense here, but he tells them that they can be set free after seven years or six years. And how it speaks about voluntary slavery and what the rules are for that. And at no point are they to be cruel to them, though. The key to the law in the scriptures of the Old Testament, that it was to be merciful, voluntary servitude, and there was never to be abuse of a slave. Never. And the reason why is because God made every individual in his image. And because we're image bearers of God, nobody was to be mistreated. And <clears throat> that the slavery that we're used to in our country that we talk about was totally different. This was not in Israel that was indentured slavery, where somebody gave themselves to pay a debt off. The African slavery that we had in our country was black men selling their own black people to the traders that were coming up and dropping them off in America and in Britain and they were using them and abused them. That was never to be way in the Israelite. It was only voluntary. And some people say, well, why didn't God get rid of slavery then? But that was the way their society worked. And it's just like the law of divorce in our country and way back in the Old Testament the Bible says that marriage is one man and one woman and together they're one and no one's to break that asunder but because Jesus said and because Moses knew the hardness of men and women's hearts what did he do? he gave the bill of it was, and the Bible says it was a concession because of the hardness of men and women's hearts rather than trusting God. And how sad that is. But the same thing was true with slavery here. And so God made provisions so as they lived in that society, it could be handled right and in honor of God. Now we're reminded here, of course, that we're to protect and value life. We are so blessed in this country of broken through that slavery issue. And as we continue to work through the black and white issue and all the discriminatory things, that we see every being as a child of God, made in his image. And that we praise God for the abolition, but we also know there's pockets still in this country. There's sometimes a prejudice that still rises itself. But we are to be the ones who hold up the value of life because God values the individual. And that brings us to the second law. Look at verses 4, 12 through 14. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. But he did not lie and wait for him. But God let him fall into his hand. Then I will appoint for you a place to which you may flee. But if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from the altar that he may die. Now we see this powerful example in the Old Testament about murder. We see two kinds of murder in this little passage right now and he elaborates on it. One is manslaughter where an accident takes place, not meant to be premeditated and the person dies, and that there's places that they can go and wait for their justice and it can be meted out. But there's also premeditated murder that the Bible does not stand up to. And it stands up to it because what it does is that the person who maybe have committed premeditated murder knows they've been found out, will run to the altar of God and plead for mercy. And they can do that. But the community is free to come and pull them off that altar then and to put them to death. 
Now, the reason is why. You know, there's many groups who disagree with this whole capital punishment. And and yet, the scriptures here speak very boldly to us today. And there's a lot of good reasons why people say why we should not have capital punishment. But here's the reason why God says, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 5, The Bible there says that God does that because man was made in the image of God. It's simply reinforcing what God says about mankind. God values our lives and the lives of the people of this earth that he created. And God commands a higher view of life because we're made in his image. And that in establishing capital punishment in the scriptures here, God has this high view of life. And that there's all kinds of ideas why we should not. But here in Genesis chapter 9, which again Moses is then speaking about, or God's speaking about in Exodus 21... It comes because life is too valuable. And that we should not take a life, but if we do, and it's premeditated, that person is to pay with their life. Because that child that's been taken was in the image of God. It's a serious thing. God hold men too. And the ground of it is totally the image of God. And that what we person does when they commit murder, premeditated murder, they are destroying and assaulting the beautiful thing that God has created in his image. And we can hear all the arguments about capital punishment. Some people say that you're just adding to the murder rate. The state is murder. No, no, that's not what God says here. It's the responsibility of the state to carry that out. He speaks about it very boldly. And premeditated murder is something that God takes seriously. There are exceptions for manslaughter. And we know in a society that they were in, especially here, life was not very valuable. They didn't treat them very valuably. In fact, in the Middle East, even to to this day, societal justice is not thought of highly. But family justice, private justice, vigilante justice is what rules the day. Family feuds. And what amazes me, it still goes on. I was reading about a Harvard grad that went to Israel. And when he went to Israel, he knew that there was this after he studied the cultures. And one day, one of the gals that he knew at work went out shopping with her brothers. And for Muslim women, they're not allowed to talk to strange men. They were out shopping and they decided... She got separated from them and she started talking with a man and the brothers got very upset. They grabbed her and threw her into the car and said, you're never to do that again because that's against Muslim law. And then that night they went to his house and they found the guy They tied him with a chain to the back of their car and drove through Jerusalem until he was almost dead. Carol Wonka. Her her and Frank were on working for the federal government. They were at an embassy over in Egypt. And talk about street justice out of control. 
She went to go shopping in the marketplace, and when she was getting back to her, her car, she said, I had to run for my life. Because what had happened was an Egyptian bus driver was driving his bus and hit a person and killed him. And the people in the bus grabbed him, dragged him out in front and beat him to death right on the street in front of the police. And nobody said anything. You see, God's giving us justice, giving them the justice of what is right to do. That they get a fair Look before the elders before they're taken in death. And I know there's a lot of Christians who say, well, hey, capital punishment doesn't stop it. Isn't it revenge? Isn't it death? Isn't it flawed? Should we do it? All those may be interesting observations but the Bible says that when a life is taken that's in the image of God premeditated that life should be taken also because it's made in the image of God and I know there are people who disagree with me pretty boldly but in these scriptures this is what God says Now, some point to the woman caught in adultery at the well. And they bring her to him. And the sad part about it, when they bring this woman caught in adultery to Jesus, they ask him what to do. Should we stone her? The problem is the guy that was with her was not with them. They let him go. Injustice. They also, too, began to put all their anger on her. And Jesus, remember, he draws in the sand. He said, who without the first, without sin cast the first stone? They couldn't because they all had sinned. God has assigned the right way to do justice and to care for life. The death penalty here is established because God's value of life is great. And now we can say all different kinds of things, but that's what God says in these passages. Now you and I all know we need to pray for states and the federal government. Realize what's going on here as we think about people like Dennis Rader, the Carr brothers. What does God say there? What do they need to understand the veracity of what they've done? What does our society need to see as they took lives made in the image of God and put empty holes in their families? That's the question. And then finally, if a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it and sells it, he shall repay five oxen for, one, for an oxen and four sheep for one sheep. And if a thief is found breaking in and struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. He's protecting his property. That's what he's doing. And if you notice here with theft, God doesn't say here one for one, they just return it and everything's good. (laughs) No. Make the criminal pay. If he stole an oxen and sells it, tell him to get five and bring them back to the owner. And that's good restitution. The same thing with a sheep. And that if he's found breaking in and he's a threat, the husband or the owner kills him. Well, should not be held liable. You see, in the Old Testament here, this is the truth that we need to see in our society. 
What if they can't pay the five oxen? Well, then they work as a slave. <laughs> That's all. They pay that owner back. Make good restitution, not just get the information, the stuff back. It's interesting that the Bible talks about Lex Tellus, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, which is part of Ham and Robbie law. But isn't it interesting that God says, no, it's not only what they took, but plus all the aggravation stuff that they had and went through, they're to be repaid. In the Hammurabi law, it's eye for an eye. And it only works for certain classes of people. In the Hammurabi law, what, during that time, is that if a person took something from another rich person, they just had to replace it. But if a rich person took it from a poor person, they didn't have to repay anything. That's how unjust it was. And this is where you see the Bible <laughs> comes out much differently. And that there's a culpability that needs to be dealt with. And finally, we come to the point where we see what this is all about. And I know there are laws right now that our state is struggling with. I don't know if you heard it in the news the other day. But this whole idea of medical marijuana. What do we think about that? Well, financially, it would be a great cash cow for the state if they tax it like they do cigarettes. But what is it doing? And what is it going to open to? Again, this past week, they decided not to pass it. And I struggle with it because when we had our church, when we started out 30 years ago in the zoo, there was a little girl who was basically very deformed. She had a lot of strokes. And her father and mother both decided, mother stayed with her all the time because of these strokes basically these seizures that she had. And they decided that he would pack up his job at Learjet and leave and get a job out in Colorado so that, that she could have marijuana to stop her seizures. And they did that and it's done well. In fact, we have a, I know a young boy that's taking CBD oil on his tongue because he has seizures. And when they put the CBD oil on his tongue every morning, he doesn't have any seizures. And then there's the other side that we worry about. Is this the door that opens up to recreational marijuana coming? And I don't know if you heard the testimony of Sheriff Easter to the state, where he said, that the officer that was killed, this rookie officer is only on a week that was killed on 135th. The fella that hit her was high on marijuana. And there's a dilemma. And we pray, we need to pray for this. We need to pray for our legislators to have wisdom in this and how what a wonderful thing it could be helpful, but yet very dangerous and that God give them discernment and that's why we come to the end here you and I as Christians Moses then is told by the Lord come up to the mountain and get the tablets bring them out to the people and that's what our job is to let people know that the laws of God are good they're helpful and that we understand that they're necessary because our society is sick and that we know that the law of God should be real. And that we have to hold up the standards. And that we understand as Christians that the law is good. God gave it to us because it's a joy to follow. 
if you're walking with him. And that we need to help our communities stay the standard. And two weeks ago, we saw that happen in the school board. Did we not? One of the superstar wrestlers from a school community was caught smoking out in the parking lot. The rules were suspension. Yeah, they but because he was superstar wrestler, tried to change the rules so he could still play and do the competition and not miss out. Even though he made this one mistake, yeah, he knew what was right and wrong and he still did it on school property. <laughs> And we need to hold those standards, folks, as Christians, because we're not helping the kids if we're buckling. And we're saying to them it's more important to be successful than to have character in your life. That's wrong. We need to stand up in this generation and make sure they understand that. And that we understand that we as Christians... Love the law because it protects us and we know God gave it to us in love. And that we ask the Holy Spirit to give us the strength to live in every day and walk in God's ways because we know they bring us abundant life. And that we help our society. Because you see, God's written a law on everybody's heart. In Romans chapter 2, he talks about how even the pagan who doesn't know about Jesus that may live over in Africa, has a law written in his heart, in his conscience, that he knows what's right and wrong. But like us, you know, I set up a law that I'm not going to break my diet. And guess what I do? I break it. And the Bible here says to us that God is not going to judge let's say, the person in Africa who does not know the Ten Commandments. He'll judge him by what he knows in his own heart. And he still needs Jesus. And then the Hebrew writer says, but we have a new law, a greater law in our covenant that we appreciate what God has done for us. And that he's given us these laws and that we enjoy following them because we know in them is life and life in its all its abundance. That's the promise. And that's the difference between those two passages. And that we, as now our hearts have been changed by Jesus, that the Holy Spirit gives us the desire to follow those laws. He gives us the desire to appreciate those laws and walk in them. Because in them are life. And we do it because we love him in gratitude for what he's done for us. In closing, I want to share with you that kind of love that we should have for our Lord and appreciate for the law. There was a woman that I knew who came from Germany when she was 14 years old. Her family was a large family. And in order for them to survive, there was a man down the street who was a little bit older than her, about seven, eight years older than her was going to come over to America for the new prosperity. And because they saw it as an opportunity for her freedom to start over in this new world, they let him marry her at 14 years old. He was about 24, 23. And he married her. Didn't know him that much except for the courting relationship that was very much guarded. And when they came over, he was a taskmaster. Grumpy, angry, made her mind. And I can remember when he died, she was grateful that he was gone. At 30. And then she met a guy at work at 33. 
She fell in love, and he loved her. And as they were, got married, she realized all the things that the first husband barked to her about and yelled her about, she was doing. But guess what? The husband that she had just loved her as she was. And she was so grateful to do them because she loved him. And she kept a beautiful, clean house because she loved him. And she wanted to satisfy him. And that's the way it is with us. The law, we shouldn't see it as a, an ogre over us, a whip and chain, but a wonderful joy of our expression of our heart of keeping it out of gratitude for what he's done for us. Let's pray together. Jesus, we just give you praise and thanksgiving today for such an awesome God that you've given us life in all its abundance and you've given us ways in which we can handle life better. Forgive us, Lord, when we don't follow your will and your way. Help us, Lord, to appreciate every day all that you've done for us and especially the guidelines you've given us in your word. Help us to follow them, Jesus, and live for you in gratitude for what you've done for us. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Please rise for the benediction and our closing song. And now go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God your Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Turn.